was the best of times. It was the worst of times. We had everything in front of us. We had nothing in front of us. Ladies and gentlemen, while all the elderly are entitled to a $2,000 healthcare voucher, refugees are living off $1,200 every month. This is no tale of two cities. It is not even a model of a welfare state. This is simply a misallocation of resources in Hong Kong. According to statistics, a staggering 2 million people are claiming government welfares. Never mind that the rising property markets are partly due to the high land price policy. We will simply build more public flats, hoping that one day supply meets demand. Never mind that inequality persists within our education system. We will simply give grants for cross-boundary learning, hoping that someday the achievement gap will shrink. Poverty alleviation is so often being reduced to mere monetary assistance. We are increasingly relying on these short-term measures to solve long-term problems. Short-term measures that fail to tackle the root causes. The first major culprit is a lack of upward social mobility. Despite inflation rates, the monthly median income for young adults has remained around $10,000 in the past 10 years. Limited career opportunities and job advancements are something that the low income working allowances cannot solve. The second major culprit is a lack of job diversification. University programs outside of traditional academic pursuits are negatively perceived as useless. 2% of street sleepers are actually college graduates. These talents, not utilized to its maximum potential, are losses to Hong Kong's economy. They are losses that cannot be reimbursed by social security. So ladies and gentlemen, today I call for policies that truly invest in the infrastructure. I call for handouts that are only for emergency. And I call for welfares to be better distributed. For the sustainability of our economy, I call for a system that truly where the poor gets the what it needs. I call for a system that has its priorities. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. Mr. McDougall will now ask you a question relating to your speech. The bell will ring right after the question has been asked, and you have one minute to respond to the question. Mr. McDougall, please. Hi. Hi. What role do you think the non-government sector should play in poverty alleviation? Thank you for your question. I think for the non-government organizations, since they are not in charge of the entire society, they are more able to focus on the minority in the society, which the government usually left out. Because the problem we see in today's society is that because the law lawmakers are trying to rally the votes of the public, they're often focusing on the majority's interest. And the minority's interests, such as ethnic minorities, just such as refugees, those are often being left out of the equation. So for non-governmental organizations, their role is to actually rally support and rally public attention for these sort of minorities in the society where the government could actually know that there's this problem in society instead of ignoring the problem altogether. So I think non-government organization plays a huge role into actually rallying public support for issues that we are often being left out in society and to actually tell the government that we have to face these sort of problems in the society. Thank you. Thank you. A second question would now be asked by Mr. Robinson. Again, the bell will ring right after the question, and you may then respond to the question. Mr. Robinson, please. Good morning. Morning. Recently, many people have been interested to watch the Winter Olympic Games. Um, some people think that sports are a great way of bringing people together. Other people criticize them and think that they cost too much money, and they maybe just highlight competition and rivalry. What do you think? Thank you for your question. 
Now, talking about rivalry and competition, I don't think it's in, uh, ex uh, inclusive in sort of uh, sports. Because in today's competition, I actually made friends with all my fellow competitors. So I think even though you're in a contest, it doesn't mean you have to hate each other. It doesn't mean you have to be really competitive and go like, hey, I hope you suck. No, it doesn't work that way. You know, in this sort of competition, we all know we're celebrating something that we love. We all know we're celebrating something we're passionate about. So I think it doesn't, it isn't actually promoting competition. I think in, in contrast, it's actually promoting friendship because everybody that loves this sort of thing comes together and they sort of show people how hard they've worked into achieving something. They show people that there's sort of value. As for the money problem, I think uh, these sort of celebrations are once in every two or four years. I think it's worth it. It actually depends on the hosting country and into actually how many money they want to spend. And I think if a country actually spends too much, such as Sochi, for example, then they're actually being criticized. And I think if thank the government you. is able, thank you.